okay so this is uh, uh, lecture number 3 okay so this is, there was a <coughs> there was a mistake i made in the last class which was pointed out to me later so the norm for a vector is defined as what positive square root of bv uh, i think i forgot the square root when i wrote down the the norm last time okay so go back and correct this come sit here if you can't hear people behind you don't seem to be complaining so i am assuming it's sort of <coughs> okay so the positive square root is something i probably missed out and uh, i think i missed it out so make sure you have that uh, okay the norm square is the inner product it's okay so let's go uh, let's keep going and uh, the last thing i was defining was baseband and passband signals okay so that's that's where we are okay so i i want to show some uh, a picture from a from a fourier transform point of view so if you have a baseband signal which is real like i said so the only signals we'll be dealing with in this course are real baseband and passband signals okay so if you have a baseband real signal how will it fourier transform look okay so fourier transform is going to have a real part and an imaginary part the real part will be what will the real part be will it have some properties will it be even symmetric right so you will have uh, symmetry about uh, zero will the real part be real <laughs> what about the imaginary part will it be real yeah, it will also be real okay. so it's just the name all right so here's the here's the here's here's how a real part might look for an x of f which is uh, baseband and real okay so baseband means it's going to be around the origin right so the non zero values for the spectrum are going to be around the origin and uh, say let's say i'm going to just roughly draw it like this and uh, it's going to be within say minus uh, w to plus w okay so some such bandwidth and the imaginary part is also going to be similar maybe i'll draw it like this okay but it will have odd symmetry around the origin and uh, it will again die out between minus w and w okay so that's how the spectrum will look for a real baseband signal so x of t is real and baseband okay so the moment a signal is real it's enough if you specify the spectrum you have to specify both the real and imaginary part but it's enough if you specify it for the positive frequencies okay you don't have to specify it for the negative frequencies which anyway don't exist we just we just write them down okay so if you go to the real a real passband signal if you think of uh, drawing a possible spectrum for a real passband signal it's going to look uh, the real part of the spectrum it's going to be once again even symmetric but i'll draw it a little differently you'll see why this kind of a picture is it's important fc is going to be somewhere in the band where it's non zero presumably okay and then it's going to die out be before and after what fc minus w fc plus w okay so the part on this side is going to be a mirror image in exact same way okay so this is how uh, the real part would look so if you were to draw the imaginary part so what is this this is x of t being real and passband okay well i'm going to draw i guess minus fc here then fc okay okay so this is the imaginary part okay so that's a way of visualizing how uh, a real and imaginary part of the spectrum will look for real signals okay so the only thing that's important here is that x of t was real okay the baseband and passband the way it worked out is the non zero parts are closer to the origin and baseband and non zero parts are around a particular center frequency fc in uh, passband okay so normally you might might be you might have used to fc being at the absolute center of the passband all that is not required the way i defined it fc has to be somewhere in that band where it is non zero typically for you to be for you to deal with this uh, comfortably 
okay so that's how that's how we uh, define these things okay so that's real baseband and real uh, passband okay so like i said I, i might have seen this before maybe but i want to repeat it once again because it's very important for this course a real passband signal can be represented using a complex baseband signal okay so what will be the difference between the spectrum of a complex baseband signal and a real baseband signal what can be different okay the spectrum of a complex baseband signal will also have a real part and an imaginary part okay right it's also a complex uh, function need not be symmetric that's the only thing okay so if you take the spectrum of the of a complex signal the real part of the spectrum will still be real the imaginary part will still be real there's no problem with the real real nature but it won't be symmetric the even symmetry and odd symmetry will not necessarily be there okay so so we'll see that those things mean uh, mean a few things so how to go from here to there is the is the important uh, idea here but you can see why it's motivated why why you get the complex thing you know i mean see if you notice here if you think of for baseband signal zero being the center frequency you have symmetry about the center frequency for the passband case if you look at only one side about the center frequency there's no symmetry okay so when you kind of move the center frequency to baseband you will not have symmetry which means you will you will probably have a complex signal okay that's one thing and the other thing is if you look at the bandwidth for the real baseband signal the actual real bandwidth in positive frequencies is only w when you go to the real passband signal what's the bandwidth in real positive frequencies 2w okay so when you get it back to baseband it's natural that you should get more than one real baseband signal if you just get only one then you can never have asymmetry around or you you, you can't occupy this 2w bandwidth with the equivalence okay so those are motivations for why they should work out from an intuitive way to a complex baseband signal not a real baseband signal. okay so we'll see how to do it it's a sequence of steps you might have seen it but i want you to pay attention because it's a uh, it's a little bit intricate you might have seen it from the time domain but i'm going to motivate it from the frequency domain do the derivation to the frequency domain first and then maybe if time permits or maybe i won't see the time domain at all the time domain is a little bit confusing so i'm going to drop it i'll only do the frequency domain uh, derivation okay so let's start with the real base passband signal and see how to break it down and represent it using a real baseband signal okay so that's what we're going to see now okay so the first definition we'll make okay so keep this picture in mind right when i say a real passband signal this picture all the way at the bottom okay so that's the spectrum you should keep in mind okay okay all right so so the first first definition okay once again x of t is real and passband okay it has a spectrum like i like i showed in the previous picture okay so the first definition okay so i'll say center frequency is fc once again center frequency is, is used in the definition of passband signals as some frequency in the non zero band okay so so the first uh, first observation you can make is x of f is going to be equal to what x star of minus f there's going to be conjugate symmetry right so that i know because x of t is real okay so the next definition i'm going to make is to say only positive frequencies matter so i'll i'll define a new spectrum with only the positive frequency okay so that i'm going to call as x plus of f i'm going to say x plus of f is set is equal to x of f when f is greater than 0 and it will be 0 for f less than or equal to 0 so i'm going to take the spectrum x of f and retain only the positive side okay only the positive side so now if i look at x plus of t which is the fourier transform of inverse fourier transform of x plus of f what kind of a signal will it be it will be complex right because you've lost the symmetry right you've kicked out the negative part you've lost the symmetry okay so if you want to imagine a filter that achieves this what what will be the frequency response of the filter that will achieve this sorry yeah you can think of the unit step if you want but it, it need not really be uh, flat in the entire frequency range you only need it to be flat in the positive range from fc plus w to fc minus w and so on. so if you have any filter like that you will get this okay so this is the thing uh, that's interesting okay so you get x plus of f okay so maybe i'll draw a general description of x plus of f how it looks okay so if you look at the real part of x plus of f it's going to look like this i'll specifically write a minus fc to show that that part is zero okay And the imaginary part if you want to draw okay so it's going to be 
something here and then the minus fc part once again will be zeroed out okay so this is my x plus of f okay all right so there's another way of writing it down if you want if you like the unit step a lot you might want to write it as what x of f times u of f okay so that's uh, another way of writing it so many different ways of doing it okay so the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to i'm going to shift this to baseband okay so how do you shift in frequency to baseband no in frequency okay so all i have to do is just do instead of f do f plus fc okay so if i change my argument to f plus fc the new plot is going to look closer to it's it's going to be a base bouncing okay so that's the next thing i will do so so i'll try to look at real part of x plus of f plus fc okay which will look like this around zero so remember this will be still between minus w and plus w right and the imaginary part will look uh, well like this okay so i can do this i can imagine doing this if you if you like in the time domain also there is an equivalent way of doing this right you will multiply by a suitable exponential you can always come back to base band okay that's possible but one one uh, one thing i want you to want to point out before we go further is okay if you look at x of f and x plus of f one thing that has changed is i've chopped out the negative frequencies what it means in reality is i mean you might say negative nothing you should lose but you'll lose something right what will you lose you lose energy okay so the energy in x plus of f will be what of the energy in x of f half of the energy okay so to compensate for that typically people try to multiply this x plus by root 2 okay so you multiply by root 2 so that the energy is equal okay so that you don't lose the energy in the equivalence okay you don't want to lose it so you want to keep that uh, keep that uh, keep that going so so i'll introduce a root 2 term as we go along that's one thing i'll do okay so maybe i'll write that down here so if you look at uh, the two norm of say x plus of f okay it's going to be 1 by root 2 times the two norm of x of f okay so that's one point you might want to note okay we'll adjust for this as we go along uh, as we go along okay so i'm going to take this x plus of f plus fc okay and then look at its inverse fourier transform okay so that will happen to be the signal that is of interest to me okay so that's my definition finally finally i'm ready to define what's called convex envelope of Uh, not convex sorry complex envelope of it's kind of a strange name i'll i'll justify it later x of t is defined as that signal x tilde of t x tilde of t which is a fourier transform with root 2 times x plus of x plus f plus fc okay so you take this x plus f plus fc you multiply by root 2 but that root 2 is just a convenience factor to pretend the energy is the same if if you are convinced about energy being the same you can drop it it's not a big deal so it doesn't change much look at its inverse fourier transform that will give you your uh, the the con complex envelope okay so if you go back and substitute it to the formula you will see this becomes root 2 x of f plus fc times u f plus fc okay so you shift x to the left and then multiply by the unit step it's a suitable unit step it's going to get rid of the uh, the negative okay so that's another way of visualizing visualizing what's happening okay if you if you want a relationship purely in terms of x you want to get rid of this x plus this is what happening this is what happens okay seems like a simple enough description but we'll have to study this in more detail so what's happening so x tilde of t for first of all will be a complex signal right so you can go back and see the symmetry has been completely lost in general and so you have complex signal okay so so i want to see more closely in what way does it exactly represent the x of t in base band so it's, it's also not too difficult to see why okay so as long as you can so when can you say it's a complete representation when you can go from x of t to x tilde of t and then go back again you should be able to go back from x tilde of t to x of t once i can do both then i have something like a one to one mapping right so i can go from here to there and there to back again so i can say i have a valid representation for my real uh, pass band signal okay so we'll see how to go back it's a little bit involved i'll i'll, I'll try to do it uh, without too much detail but it's it's, it's easy to see uh, why that will happen again okay so i'll give you the formula first so going back 
I'll give you the formula first and then I'll give you a justification for why that is true. X of t you can show equals root 2 times real part of x tilde of t e power j 2 pi f c t. Okay. So if I define x tilde of t like this, I can show if I take x tilde of t which is a complex baseband signal, multiply it with e power j 2 pi f c t which is the exponential with frequency f c and take its real part, well the root 2 adjustment is once again to adjust for the power or the energy. Once you do that, you get back your x of t exactly intact without any problem. Okay? So in a way it should be possible because all the information that was in the spectrum is still retained in x tilde of t. So you should be able to go back by suitable uh, playing around with the spectrum. So and that, that's, that's done by this nice nice looking uh, neat operation. Okay? So, so uh, I'll, I'll justify this. The so first thing is real part. Okay, when you take real part, what happens to the signal? Okay, so that's something that you should know. If you have x of t being a Fourier transform pair with x of f, okay, so what happens to real part of x of t? How do you write real part of x of t? x of t plus x conjugate of t divided by 2. Okay, so if you write it in this way, you'll see this goes to x of f plus x conjugate of minus f by 2. Okay. So that's the first thing. So you've taken care of the real part. When you do real part of a signal, what happens is the spectrum gets added to its conjugate uh, mirror imaged divided by 2. It has to happen. Why? Because when you go from complex to real, your spectrum has to suddenly become conjugate symmetric. So you have to go from x of f to a conjugate, conjugate symmetric form in all cases. So it has to happen. Something like this has to happen. Okay. So you get this. So that's the first thing. And the next thing is e part j 2 pi of ct. What does it do in the spectrum? Yeah, it shifts. Shifts to the right by uh, fc. Okay. And then you take the real part. You do x star of minus f. It will be easy to justify this. Okay. So I'll write one more equation. If you, if you want a real justification, I'll write one more step. That's basically uh, this result. You can show. You can show. You, can, you need to also use this, this result. You, you have to use that x of f will be, I believe, x plus of f plus uh, x plus conjugate of minus f. Okay, so x plus of f was only the positive frequency part. Okay, you do a conjugate reverse of that, that will give you the negative frequency, right? So x of f is equal to this. So you use these two relationships. It's a very trivial step. One more step to show that this is exactly true. And you'll have to adjust for the root two carefully. There's a by two coming. There's also a root two in the definition of x plus. It will work out properly. Okay, so. So I'm not doing the complete derivation. So you use these two guys, these two facts. You can quickly show that this is uh, this is true. Okay. So what we have finally established is a real passband signal x of t is equivalent to its equivalent or is represented by its convex envelope x tilde of t. How do you define it? You take the positive parts alone, shift it to baseband, and then take its inverse Fourier transform. That's your con convex envelope de de definition. And it's a proper representation because you can also go back from the convex envelope to a real passband signal. Okay. What about FC? What role did FC play in all of this? Yeah, it's just an arbitrary shift. So you can imagine one complex baseband signal can represent an arbitrary number of real passband signals. Just change FC, you get a different passband signal. Okay. So so that's another interesting relationship. If you want to, if you want to map the set of all base passband signals to the set of all baseband signals, it will be a many to one type relationship. Okay, so FC plays a role which determines how it's shifted. Okay, so that's what I want to establish. This is, there's an equivalence between X of T and <coughs> X tilde of T which uh, hopefully you are convinced about. Okay, so you can go back and forth between the two. Okay, a particularly important thing here is to, to think about it from a practical point of view. Why would something like this be really useful? Okay, so one of the complications is X of T can be on a circuit. It can be carried by a single wire, right? Well, single wire to ground or just two wires, right? You only need one quantity, one voltage or something. What do you need for X tilde of T? You need two. Okay, but is there an advantage? Did you gain anything? Why have you gone from one wire to two wires now in a circuit? What is the advantage? Yeah, so the bandwidth is lesser now. So right, it's all baseband. So you probably have better filters, 
better everything in baseband and you can maybe do some smart things much more easily in lower frequencies. So even though you have increased the number of signals you have to keep, keep, keep track of when you go from pass band to base band, advantage is you've gained are so immense that it's, it's worthwhile. Okay, so this is pretty much done all the time. Nobody really processes pass band signals. You always shift it to complex base band and keep track of two different guys and process them. Okay, so this is something which is done all the time. All right. So even from a theory point of view, it's useful. That's one one no, notion from a practical circuit building point of view. But from a theory point of view, it's again useful because go back to my uh, go back to my formulation for the channel. What what did, what is the what is the model for my channel? Y of t is x of t plus n of t. Now I can restrict myself completely to only baseband x of t. I don't have to look at any passband x of t at all, right? I can restrict myself totally and completely to a baseband x of t and do all my design and thinking around a baseband x of t. Maybe it's simple in some fashion and it will equally apply well enough to any passband system because as long as I keep my x of t complex, I have to allow it to be complex, right? So as long as I allow it to be complex, then I can go to any pa passband situation also just by multiplying by suitable exponentials shifting back and forth. It makes a lot of sense both from theory and practice. So this is used all the time. Okay, the next thing is, is there any question floating around? Everybody is happy? No confusion as to how this happened. Okay, so so if, uh, okay, so I want to comment about this name convex envelope. Why is it called convex envelope and maybe show you a plot to justify why it's uh, actually an envelope of x of t. But before that, one interesting derivation that you can try is to write a time domain expression for x of t in terms of, no, for x tilde of t in terms of x of t. Okay, so I did not write a time domain expression. Say I wrote it in frequency domain and I said do a Fourier transform and get it. Okay, any answers what, what will play a role when you do a time domain? You'll, you'll, the Hilbert transform will play a role. Okay, so you'll see the real part of x of t will, will have a very simple relationship with, uh, real part of x tilde of t will have a direct relationship with x of t. For the imaginary part, you'll have to do a Hilbert transform. Okay, so that's, that's how the time domain representation works, but in frequency domain it's easier to understand. Okay, so let me just quickly motivate the convex, convex envelope part of it. Okay, so let's write down, let's look at this expression closely. Which expression? This, this expression going from, uh, it's root 2, real part of x tilde of t e power j 2 pi f c t. Okay, so I'm going to now introduce more notation for talking about x tilde of t x tilde of t I'll write as x i of t plus j x q of t. Okay, write out its real part and imaginary part explicitly. This is typically called the in phase part and this is called the quadrature part. Okay, this is standard uh, terminology. The i part and the q part, you'll see people always referring it as to the i and the q. Okay, in phase and quadrat quadrature components of the convex envelope x tilde of t. So if I plug it back in and multiply it out with e power j 2 pi of c t and take the real part multiply by root 2, you will see x of t will work out to root 2 x i of t cosine 2 pi of c t minus root 2 x q t sine 2 pi of c t. Okay? This is how x of t will work out to if you actually substitute it back into the formula and work it out. Okay, so it's not too difficult to see this. Okay, so remember the x i of t and x q of t are what type of signals? Real and then baseband as well. Okay, so x tilde of t is also baseband. So real and baseband signals. Okay, so 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 what else? Okay, so and then x tilde of t, x of t is also a real signal. Okay, so everything is real. So you see, it's good to see a nice real expression. Okay, so you have a lot of real part and tildes floating around, but it's finally good to see a nice uh, real expression. This also gives you the motivation for why convex envelope and why real envelope and all that. Okay, so why this convex envelope uh, name came about. Okay, so if you try to plot a signal like this, okay, where x i of t is baseband, and then you have a cos 2 pi of c t, and imagine f c being very very large, how will such a signal look? It will be a cosine 2 pi of c t, but modulated, okay, assume x i of t is positive, just for simplicity. It will be modulated by this baseband x i of t, okay. So in that sense, x i of t will be the envelope of this entire signal, x i of t cos 2 pi of c t, okay. So it will, you can imagine something like this, right. So I have the, 
right? I am drawing it very, very poorly. I am sorry. So it should be equal like this if you assume it's all positive, right? It will look like this. And your xi of, xi of t will be this guy. Okay, assuming it's positive. If it's negative, it will cross over and all that. There's some confusion. So I'll just ditch that. So this, this envelope is, right? This envelope is xi of t. Okay, and the frequency at which that oscillation comes about is x uh, to is fc, right? Cos 2 pi fct. A similar story will be true for the other part also. Xq of t sin 2 pi fct. But what will be the difference between the cos 2 pi fct and sin 2 pi fct? There will be a phase lag or lead or whatever you want to call it of 90 degrees. Okay, so while this starts at maximum here, where will that same point be at time 0 for sin? It will be at 0. So there will be a small phase lag between those two. Well, significant phase difference between the two and then the envelope will be x q of t okay so you take the envelope corresponding to the cosine part and take the envelope corresponding to the sine part put them to put the two together you get the convex envelope of x of t okay okay so that's the that's the final story here okay so it's, this this equation itself is very interesting as in any passband signal real passband signal can be written in this form Okay, sine multiplying a baseband minus cosine multiplying another baseband signal. Okay, those two are envelopes. You take those two envelopes, put them together with J floating around, you get a convex envelope. Okay, so that the name envelope is justified because it is it is actually an envelope of some amplitude modulated sine wave. Okay, so that's the reason why uh, this name comes about. And uh, I want to draw more pictures to illustrate what's happening here. Okay. So the picture I want to draw is the following. Okay, so this up conversion and down conversion picture, and I want to have add more comments also. Okay, so that's the picture of how to go from the in phase and quadrature parts to the uh, passband signal. Okay, so if you have x i of t and x q of t. Okay, remember together what is this? x tilde of t, right? x tilde of t is actually two wires, one carrying x of t, another carrying x q of t. So how do you go to the real uh, passband signal? You multiply one by root two cosine omega. Well, I'm writing omega. Okay, so I think maybe we shouldn't write omega. I'm sorry. Two pi of c t. Okay, multiply the other by root two sine. 2 pi of ct okay so typically what people do is you have one crystal and then you phase shift it by 90 degrees so that one becomes 90 degrees out of phase with the other so you can think of one as cos and the other as sine okay so it comes out and then you add well you add actually you should add this and subtract this right you get x of t okay so this is a this is what's called an up conversion picture Okay, so in practice, you'll see people referring to this as the I channel and the Q channel. Okay, so both the I and the Q channels actually occupy the same frequency band. Okay, the exact same frequency band around FC, but they are separable. Okay, so how do you separate? Here's the down conversion picture. Okay, so you have an x of t coming in. So you first split it, multiply one by. So all these root twos are quite irrelevant. Okay, so hopefully I'm just writing them down for completeness. But in practice, you don't worry about things like root two. Okay, you don't measure the amplitude to see if it is. Okay, and then what do you do? You do a low pass filter here and the low pass filter here, what will you get? You will get xi of t and xq of t. So even though these two signals, the i and q channel occupy the same frequency band, you can receive them separately. Okay, So you can go through this down conversion process and uh, separate them very easily. Okay, So I do not want to go through this derivation, it is very easy to show that 
the signal will be a baseband component plus something at 4 pi FCT or something. So you put a simple filter around uh, the baseband frequency, so you'll get back your X, Xi of T and Xq of T. Okay. What is one significant assumption in this down conversion? Is there a huge assumption from a practical point of view? Assuming this up and down conversion happen at physically different locations, what am I assuming? FCs have to be exact. Okay. If the FC is not exact, what happens? There is going to be something in XI of T. There is going to be an E power J. There is going to be an extra. Yeah, there is going to be an extra thing which is floating around. Okay, and then all kinds of complications can cross occur because of that. Okay, so assumption is this this process is coherent. Okay, so we'll assume always that it's coherent. It's possible to transfer this FC exactly to the receiver using some nice signal processing ideas. It's called carrier synchronization. Okay, so you can achieve that in practice. Uh, so, so it's possible to assume that you have the same FC at some other location also. Okay, so you get the XA of T and XQ of T together. This form the complex envelope X tilde of T. Okay, so now go back to my uh, to my uh, what should I say to my uh, channel picture. Okay, so I have have to convert a sequence of bits into a real signal X of T and send it across on a channel. Okay and then receive it and process it and so on. Okay. If my channel is baseband, okay, then my signal X of T has to be real baseband. If my channel is passband, what can I do? You can do two real baseband signals. Do you see that? Okay. So it is almost as if, if as just by having a passband channel, you are capable of now dealing with two real baseband signals. So you can imagine two streams of bits being modulated into two real baseband signals which together make the convex envelope which then gets upconverted into one passband signal. Okay, So it somehow seems like you can do more in passband. Why is that? There is more bandwidth, right? So there is more real bandwidth. Okay, In baseband if I say W is the bandwidth, then I have only 0 to W. In passband if I say 2, two W, then I have 2 W. Entire 2 W I can use. Okay, I do not have to maintain the symmetry around FC. Okay, I have to only maintain a symmetry around 0. In base band, I have to maintain a symmetry around 0. So what is on the negative band has to be exactly equal to what is on the positive band. Okay, in, in pass band, that is not true. Okay, so it is a very natural extension. So since you are using 2 times the bandwidth, you can expect 2 times the data to ride on the same bandwidth and it is separable. Okay, so that is the way to think about it. So in practice, people use this. It is called quadrature amplitude modulation. Okay, so it is used in a thing called quadrature amplitude modulation. It is very, very popular. Today, pretty much every decent uh, digital communication system uses this quadrature amplitude modulation. Okay, where you use in a passband channel, you are able to send two streams of data together riding on the same frequency band around a center frequency. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, QAM is called. All right. So, 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 so. so. I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Let me just quickly see if I wanted to say anything more. I think, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Okay. All right. So, any questions on this uh, baseband, passband, and suddenly why are we getting the two times in passband alone? What's so great about that? It's, it's probably clear, right? It's okay. All right. So, so we'll we'll move along. So, remember we are still in preliminaries. I want to wrap up the preliminaries quickly and then uh, move further. The next thing we need is to move from continuous time to discrete time. I will do the Nyquist sampling theorem formally because I will I'll, I'll use it several times in so many different guises. So I, sh I think you should know, know this a uh, little bit formally as well. So I will write down Nyquist sampling theorem. This is what enables this uh, digital processing and sampling and all that. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so 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 you might have learnt it in uh, various ways. So so what's the standard way in which you talk about Nyquist sampling? If you have a signal band limited to a bandwidth W, it's enough if you take samples one by two W away. You can accurately and completely reconstruct your original signal just by those samples. Okay, so there are several ways of understanding it. One way of understanding it is it's possible to write a continuous time signal as long as it is limited in bandwidth as a sequence of numbers. 
okay which means you're going you're losing dimension right so you potentially have an infinite dimensional entity initially x of t from there you're going to x0 x1 x2 so on okay you're losing dimension okay so it seems to be something that, that you're losing but still you're able to go back okay all that all that it means is when you have good signals which are limited to bandwidth you, it's possible to think it's possible to have a countable basis okay so in, in, even though it's infinite dimensional you can have a basis for it uh, for it which is countable okay so it's like for your series and all these things that you think about so it's enough to give you give a series of numbers from that you can go back to this uh, signal as long as it's limited and bandwidth that's very important okay so that's what i'm going to quickly do now uh, so you'll see how it works out okay so it's a very simple formula to write down okay so suppose you have a signal x of t which is which i will say belongs to l2 okay so i will need a finite energy signal okay so its spectrum additionally is going to be contained in a bandwidth minus w by 2 to w by 2 okay so yeah and then the spectrum what will what do we know about the spectrum okay it's also going to be in l2 right so it will be another finite energy signal in x of f okay so it will be something like this okay so that's how it will look and you know this will also be in l2 because you had the original thing in l2 okay so first thing i'll do is to look at the spectrum which is between minus w by 2 and w by 2 and expand it in a fourier series okay so you know that's always possible if you have any time limited uh, function time no, any finite support function as in time limited function but it just doesn't vanish over a small interval you can do a periodic extension of that if you want then write down a fourier series type thing for me so i'm going to imagine a periodic extension of this x of f with period w okay and then writing a fourier series expansion for it okay so that's the way that's the way probably you've been taught so that's that's what that's what you're going to write okay so i'm going to expand this minus infinity to infinity xn i'll write e power minus j 2 pi f n by w maybe you wrote it as plus but it's okay you can write minus or plus it's always going from minus infinity to infinity makes no difference this is a fourier series expansion which is valid in what for mod f less than or equal to w by 2 technically okay right the left hand side vanishes outside of minus w by 2 and w by 2 what about the right hand side it's periodic it repeats in every w interval it's going to repeat okay so it's periodic forever so i'll say i i'll restrict my f to w by 2 just to make this thing exact what is xn now what's xn Okay, so maybe you are used to doing this with t and suddenly when I do Fourier series with f maybe you are scared. Okay, so don't worry about t. t is just a variable. You can do Fourier series for any f of x. As long as it is contained in a finite support 0 to t you can do it. Any, any f of x does not matter. right? e power minus j you can do it. Do not worry about it too much. So what is the Fourier series formula now? 1 by w integral minus w by 2 to w by 2 x of f e power I will do plus j. 2 pi f n by w. I am doing this plus and minus just because I inverted the thing. I mean, you can do it in any way you want. Okay, df. This is these are my Fourier series coefficients. Okay, so what is this now? To stare at it very closely, this integral is nothing but the inverse Fourier transform of x of f evaluated at n by w. So this is in very simply 1 by w x n by w. Okay. So, these Fourier series coefficients for x of f are what? Samples of x of t. You knew this. Okay? There is nothing great about it. You must have seen this somewhere. As long as. So, why do you need this finite support? Because only then Fourier transform will exist, right? You have to have a finite extent for your x of f. Only then you can do this e power j 2 pi f by w. If you don't have finite, you can't do that. Okay? So, that is why you need it. And Fourier series coefficients are samples of x of t which is again something you might expect okay it's not something uh, very difficult to worry about okay so i'm going to write this this guy back again in a slightly different form i'll write x of f equals summation i want to drop this this mod f less than or equal to w by 2 i don't like it too much and then i also want to get rid of this xn in terms of the original thing so i'll write it as 1 by w x n by w why don't you just come and sit here this this part is not very uh, comfortable. 1 by w x of n by w. What will you have next? Okay, so you're going to have e power minus j 
2 pi f n by w. I want to drop this mod f less than or equal to w by 2. So instead of that, I can say rect minus w by 2, w by 2, what f. Okay. Hopefully everybody is happy with that. It's just another way of saying mod f is less than or equal to w by 2. Okay. So my original w by 2 went out of the screen. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Maybe you can still see it. Okay. So, so that's my picture. So now what am I going to do? I have a picture completely in F. Okay. I can do a inverse Fourier transform and go to a picture completely in T. Okay. And that will give you my Nyquist sampling theorem. Okay. So what's the what's the frequency of Fourier transform for X of F? It's X of T. Okay. Then I have the summation. The reason why all these summations and integrations can be exchanged is because I said X of T is an L2. Once you have L2, everything is, will work. There's no problem. You don't have to worry about arbitrary terms showing up here and there. It will it'll work out very nicely. Infinite to infinity. X of N by W. If you do some work and convert that rect into a Fourier transform, there's also an E par minus J. Okay, So you can see how it will look. Okay, Rect is going to go to a sink. Okay, and then this E par minus J is going to make that sink shift. Okay, so once it shifts and this 1 by W will see it will cancel with some something else. So all that will go away. So you will get ultimately sync. I have written here. Uh, okay, the way I have written here is W times. Yeah, I think sync W T minus N by W. Yeah, that's fine. That is fine. Okay, so you can show this is true for all T. Okay, so this is your uh, famous Nyquist sampling theorem which says x of t if it's contained within a finite bandwidth minus w by 2 to w by 2 is completely reproducible using its samples spaced 1 by w seconds away okay you take samples forever you have, all you have to do is a simple sync interpolation to get back your x of t at every possible time instant t okay so this is an important uh, result for us okay so if you, if you don't use uh, this result it's difficult to uh, Difficult to justify so many things you do in digital communications today. Okay, so this is a very basic. Uh, okay, so, 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 so. Okay, so I think this should be very familiar to you. You might have seen this in several forms. But this is the form in which I'm going to introduce it. Okay, so another thing that you might want to check. This is this is nothing but an orthogonal basis expansion. Okay, so you might not have seen this before. If maybe, maybe you should know that this is an orthogonal basis expansion okay so these guys just like e power j 2 pi f uh, 2 pi f n f by w okay so those things form a basis for finite support uh, functions these guys form a basis for finite bandwidth functions okay they are also orthogonal you can check that this inner product will vanish sync w t minus n by w and sync uh, w t minus m by w will be what you can show will be 0 if m is not equal to n okay so it's a very simple thing to show okay you can prove it using Fourier transform okay so you go to the Fourier transform domain you get the e power j's they will always have this property okay so this is a this is nothing but an orthogonal basis expansion but the nice thing about this orthogonal basis is the multiplying coefficients happen to be samples of x of t if you use any other orthogonal basis you won't necessarily get samples of x of t you'll get a complicated integral formula Okay, which, may not may, which may not be very useful. But for this orthogonal basis, the multiplying terms happen to be samples of x of t, which is very, very useful in practice. Okay, So like you might have already known, this, this sampling theorem justifies digital signal processing completely. Okay, So you can take an x of t. Okay, Just to be sure, typically there is a low pass filter at w by 2. Okay, And then what do you do? You sample it at rate 1 by w you get your sequence xk okay so i'll use i'll use x of k here just to be just to be consistent with the way i'm going to write down okay you'll get samples x of t x of k now what can you do with these samples okay with modern computers and all these things available you can just take these samples and store them wherever okay once you store all the samples you can process it using all the complicated algorithms that you know Okay, do anything you want with those numbers, add them, multiply them, subtract them, divide them, take tan inverse, take whatever, hyperbolic sign, whatever you want to do, you can do to those numbers very easily. If you want to do all those functions in X of T directly without sampling, it's difficult. Okay, there are only so many things you can do 
in analog working with circuits. Okay, once you sample them, get them as samples, you can do whatever you want to those numbers inside a computer. Okay, so typically those that's called a processor. It's a digital signal processor. Okay, so there are several of them available today. And then once you're happy with all the processing you've done, you're going to get y of k. Okay, then what do you do? You can kind of interpolate this y of k very coarsely first, just maybe sample and hold for a while, and then you do the proper sync interpolation, which is which you can show is nothing but an LPF. Okay, you do a simple low pass filter, you get back a continuous time waveform, which is a processed form of x of t. Okay, so this is a very, very powerful idea which motivates this entire area of digital signal processing and this is possible as long as the bandwidth that's coming in is low enough, you, you can do that. Okay, so in pretty much all the processing that we will do at the receiver, okay, so the receiver you imagine y of t is a continuous time signal that's coming in, the first box will always be a low pass filter at a frequency and followed by a sample. Okay. This is something that will be common to pretty much any digital communication system today. So you convert it into a discrete time signal and then do all your processing in discrete time. So you can implement complicated algorithms. You can, you can imagine having complicated algorithms. All that is possible because I know I can do it digitally without losing anything. I don't lose anything in the process. That's another thing to keep in mind. Okay. All right. So I think I think we are getting okay. So I think this is probably a good good place to stop because the next preliminaries we need or uh, maybe you can pass along this. So, so, so I think I was hoping to finish the preliminaries today, but maybe it's not possible. Maybe it's a good place to stop as well. So next week, I'll begin by looking at uh, discrete time Fourier transforms and Z transforms, just establishing the notation, making sure we quickly go through the main results there. And then uh, we'll do something called spectral factorization, which you maybe you have not seen in digital signal processing. And then after that, we'll proceed. Okay.